Hi, welcome back to our second ever debate um, for the Dickens versus Tolstoy, the great debate, the greatest debate. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, so this time around, we'll be doing uh, the Pickwick Papers by Charles Dickens. Um, I've just missed this so much, honestly. Like it's so been so long since like the first one. Um, and then once again, as you can see, I will be on Dickens team again this round and Carolyn will be on Tolstoy's round. So um, <laughs> if you guys haven't voted yet, we did a little pre-vote on Instagram, but also by the time the live show and the debate is over, I'll be posting like a poll on YouTube, just on the little community place for you guys to vote um, if you end up changing sides or anything like that by the time it's over. So I'll obviously like, tell you guys when that's up as well. But um, yeah, so basically what we're gonna do, Carolyn's gonna give you like a little synopsis, a little background about the Pickwick Papers and stuff like that. Um, and then I guess we'll go through our little rundown of the debates and then we're gonna <laughs> rock, paper, scissors our way into um, determining scissors, which one of us yeah. starts. But anyway, yes. And oh, also while she's talking, please feel free to like leave your thoughts, your rating. Um, whose team you're on, what you thought of the book overall. I know it was a really long two month journey um, mm -hmm. that we went on. So, yes. Anyway, I feel like I feel like we haven't had this in so long, even though it has only been two months. So, mm -hmm. I'm just so excited. So, mm -hmm. anyway, okay. Are we ready for my background? Um, Pickwick Papers, written by Charles Dickens. In case you didn't know. Um, okay. So let's see. Um, this was Dickens' first novel. It was originally serialized, and then he, well, what I love about Dickens is that because his books were serialized, when the series was completed, people could bring them to a book binder and have them all bound into one volume, which I just think is, like, Aww. that process. Like, imagine doing that today, like, having one of your favorite authors doing something like that and then completing it, having one full volume. I would love that. Um, okay, so this is chronicling a sequel, um, a sequence of loosely related av adventures written for serialization in a periodical. It was published in monthly installments from March of 1836 until November of 1837. The first installment was published on March 30th, 1836. And I also thought that this was pretty interesting in April um, the 2nd of April, 1836, Dickens marries Catherine Ho uh, Hogarth, and by January 6th, 1837, they have their first child. So around this time, a lot of things were changing in his life, which I think is really interesting because that's really when his career took off. Now this, um, I found incredible. So the first installment of the Pickwick Papers sold about 500 copies, and then um, the last, the last um, installment of the Pickwick Papers sold forty thousand. Compared, like the first one five hundred, yeah. the last one forty thousand, which just really shows you how incredible an impact yeah. this story had on everyone. Um, and there were even theatrical adaptations before the series was even completed, and Pickwick, Pickwick merchandise began to appear. <laughs> um, people could buy Pickwick cigars songbooks and china figurines wow so it's like you know pre pre funko pops and um and different little like bookmarks and things which i just love imagine getting like um a china dish for like i don't know a modern book i just, i love it um <laughs> let's see okay so for the synopsis, in case you guys are unfamiliar with Pickwick or you haven't read it, I'm not sure if we're going to get into spoilers because we really didn't for Childhood Boyhood Youth. I don't think so. Really. So, yeah, I feel like we can stay pretty clear of spoilers. Um, okay, so the synopsis for the Pickwick Papers is the main character is named Samuel Pickwick, and he is the main character of the novel and is the founder of the Pickwick Club. Um, he and his three friends, Mr. Winkle, Mr. Snodgrass, and Mr. Tupman, travel around the country and report back on their adventures and misadventures to the members of the Pickwick Club. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much the main gist. Um, it's really like a short story collection of yeah. what these men get up to, yeah. um, traveling all around the country, the things that, the bad things that happen to them, the funny things. 
good things. So, yeah. yeah it's just a wild ride. Honestly. It is. It really is. Um, okay. Well, right. so for the debate, very much like last time, it's just going to be the exact same categories. We're going to be starting with the author's life and influence, stuff that Dickens um, was doing, stuff that was happening to him, what went into the Pickwick Papers, uh, what influenced him. And then we'll move into the writing. Uh, and then after that, I believe it's characters, uh, plot. And then we'll finish up with like the intent, some commentary, some insights, and I guess just like some discussion and stuff like that. So, yeah. I'm really excited. <laughs> Me too. Um, should we shall we rock paper scissors? I think so. Okay. Do you do you do one or do you do best out of three? Maybe just one. Just one. Okay. And do you do? Yeah. Okay. Wait. Do you do? Do you go rock <laughs> paper scissors or do you go rock paper scissors shoot? I always do rock paper scissors shoot. Oh my gosh. Okay. Is that okay? No, it's fine. It's fine. We can do that <laughs> one. <laughs> What? Okay. So okay, we'll do rock, paper, scissors, okay. go. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. <laughs> Was that delayed? No, I no, I have, rock. I have a rock. Okay. So you go first, yeah. Okay, I think you. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm like, is this going to work? Are we doing this, is, guys? We're just going <laughs> to. We're very professional, as you can tell. Okay. So the first category, like Emma said, I'm just. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm looking down, I'm just looking at my notes because uh, I need mm -hmm. some structure doing this. Okay, so <laughs> the first category, like we said, is how the author's life and experience related to their writing of the novel. Um, so what is great about the Pickwick Papers is that it's really all about everyday London life, specifically for these men. Um, so most of the topics Dickens addresses in the book are addressing everyday aspects of London or English life. Um, sometimes it relates to the different classes, but it mainly relates to these middle to upper class men. Um, so, and then I also have here, um, even though this is a comical novel, he brings very relevant and serious topics to the forefront while making them comedic, which I think yeah. is really interesting because like, you know, Tolstoy does that same thing. He brings very important topics to the forefront, but in a more serious, subdued mm -hmm. way, whereas Dickens really likes to bring the comedy and make it sort of make fun of mm -hmm. these issues and mm -hmm. look light at them. Um, and then, let's see, such, so he likes to um, bring the the injustice of the justice, justice system forward, really show you the flaws in uh, the society that they live in. And then Dickens also had firsthand a look at the legal system when he worked as a law clerk, and his outrage over the incompetence of the system shows up in more than one of his novels. He yeah. really talks about, um, especially his father um, went into major debt, and he actually had to live in the debtor's prison with his family while Dickens was basically forced to work in a blacking factory because they needed some kind of money and Dickens was, you know, the, the only one to provide that. So he really had firsthand experience with hardship and loss and, uh, and debt. So there are scenes in the debtor's prison in Pickwick Papers. So we can sort of assume that those experiences earlier in his life really related to the events of the novel or some of the stories. Um, so like I said before, he uses humor while writing these scenes, which can add to their gravity while also expressing a sense of lightness and um, making the reader understand the serious quality of the book, but also, you know, have fun while reading it. Yeah. yeah. And to break that down even further, Dickens' entire goal was to relate his experiences to the everyday experiences of men and sometimes women. Um, <laughs> We'll get into that um, in the book. So, yeah. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Just for right now, it seems like a lot of people are like pretty on both teams, which is Ooh, exciting. Team both. Okay. And then I think like overall, most people are saying they gave it around three, three and a half. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think this one overall, the first thing I want to say as well is that this was. Um, definitely a tough book to get through. And I know, like Carolyn's saying, it is serialized. It would have come out, I think, in monthly like mm -hmm. installments for the people of the day. And of course, we read it over a very long two months. I'm not going to yeah. lie. Um, 
it was definitely a struggle to return to, especially once I kind of reached the halfway point. And I think a lot of us probably that started to get started to get a little bit repetitive. The humor kind of was the same thing over and over again. Um, but I think that's definitely like something to consider a little bit because like when I felt like, oh my gosh, I don't want to like <laughs> return back to this book again for another like mm -hmm. 20 pages a day. I was just like the people that were reading it then would have been like highly anticipating, waiting for the next kind of volume exactly. to come out and to read what mm -hmm. had happened. Um, whereas we're just reading it like it is kind of a novel and a very dense book, but mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I don't really have that, like, too much to say about the author's life and influence, but I think, like, just with the theater and, like, the theatricality of Dickens and stuff like that, like, the introduction was talking, um, a little bit about how he would, like, go to the theater all the time, and, like, then he would become so inspired, he would, like, memorize these people's, like, lines and monologues and stuff like that, and then he would take kind of that stage culture and what he was seeing, and then he would put it kind of into his book. And so that's where a lot of the theater I think comes from. And it's not that it's kind of not reality and it's not, it's not like Tolstoy's reality and the very like mm -hmm. realism um, that's found in his books, but it's kind of a different reality. It's just a bit more removed. Um, and yeah, I just love that like in the Pickwick papers too, there's kind of this like interactive element almost where like, like it was kind of staged. A lot of it is very, um, there's a lot of like farce and it is staged, but then there's so much description like we'll talk about later with the writing where it was just so interactive and it really like mm -hmm. just kind of pulled right. you in mm -hmm. and stuff like that yeah Definitely. um and then probably the last thing I want to say I just think this is such a good place for like someone like a writer to start um writing because the Pickwick Papers isn't even a book it's just like a bag of yeah. every single <laughs> genre you could think of and like genres you can't even think of stuff like you can't categorize at all and like every single chapter is just like something new mm -hmm. um, and it always just flips around and Dickens is like writing ghost stories and romances and mm -hmm. comedy so much comedy but then as well there's so much like social issue mm -hmm. uh, brought up there's so much legal injustice um there's just like everything you could ever think of under the sun so i think this was just such like an exciting place for him to start and then it's so cool seeing like those mm -hmm. little moments that we'll see i guess later on in yeah. his other works especially the christmas carol part yeah. um i don't know if anyone got to that part but i like flipped the page and i was like oh. it's like a little prelude to the christmas carol yes. which is nice but and um yeah. i gave it I think three stars, maybe mm -hmm. 3.5. Um, mm -hmm. But what I was going to say was that, like, I think that it's so interesting to see Dickens really sort of trying to figure out who he, like, yeah. what kind of writer he wants to be and who he wants to be in the literary world. And like you're saying, with trying to write all these different genres and yeah. kind of, you know, combine it into this one story of the Pickwick Club. I think it's just so fantastic to really yeah. see where he began. Um, I was talking a bit about this, I think I said it in my Goodreads review, but like I wouldn't recommend starting with Pickwick Papers if you're new to Dickens, because yeah. I do feel like it's not like his strong point. So I think, you know, definitely started a strong point for him because Dickens is one of those writers where, you know, his his list of books is pretty long yeah and i just feel like this book can bog you down a bit but it yeah, is so absolutely. great for the dickens fans like us who kind of want to see where he began and to really um it's almost like we're seeing like the roots underneath the flower you know it's like <laughs> where, where he began where where all of his literary techniques really took shape so it's yeah. just fantastic to look at it that way yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just, I guess I'll give my like little rating and opinion too before we like get too much into defending like one or the other. But um, I was originally going to give it like, th yeah, three, three and a half. But then like I got to the end and I closed the book and like I just, I was so surprised because it was just like, it's over. Like I was, I was so saddened and I didn't expect it to be so bittersweet. Um, mm -hmm. But like the book was actually done. So I think in the end I gave it around 3.8, like almost a four star, but I think just like 3.8. Yeah. It's very specific. Yeah. I know. Thank you. Uh, sorry. I don't know what the heck. But um, yeah, and I definitely agree. Like these were my favorite parts, the little stories that yeah. weren't directly related to the Pickwickians, but that mm -hmm. they found along on the road. Um, the ghost stories, the Christmas stories, mm -hmm. uh, everything like that. And oh, yes, this I agree with as well. He was my favorite character <laughs> too. Yeah. He was my favorite too. I know. I know. So um, good. But yeah, 
Um, okay, yes, we have some four stars, yeah. But yeah, I do okay. agree with you about like starting, maybe not starting with Dickens at this, like this book, yeah. but mm -hmm. um, yeah. Anyway, shall we into the writing? Yes, okay. you, you can take take it away. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I think the first thing I probably wanna say about Dickens writing in here, um, it's kind of related to character and a little bit place, but he's just like so good. Um, at letting us know like immediately who like exactly someone is um, and usually just like showing that off in such a minor detail that like someone as a writer and probably someone in real life you wouldn't even think to kind of describe or um, talk about like for example the first time he describes uh, Mr. Pickwick I think it's in like chapter two or something like that um, it's just like we immediately know who he is like he's talking about how Mr. Pickwick is like the one doing like the clothing. I don't know if you remember mm -hmm. this, but it's like, he's the one clothing his clothes or something like that. Um, I, so. I don't know, he's just so good at like introducing someone and like mm -hmm. we immediately know who they are and like they couldn't be um, like anyone else at all. So that's like super impressive. And like, I know that does show up later in his works, but just seeing as well how many characters um, are in this book too and how they're all so distinct was like so wonderful. Um, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, should I make a point? Yes, absolutely. Go ahead. Um, so I did write down how great it was to really see, you know, where Dickens began. Um, mm -hmm. I did include a quote. So um, I, I did say that his, his humor, I think, is like top notch in this book. Like, it was <laughs> so funny. Yeah, Some of the scenes were just like l laugh out loud funny. Um, Okay, let's see. Um, okay, this is from chapter four, page 62 in my edition, which is the Penguin Black Spine. Um, so I would just read out this scene. Um, we will not say uh, fled, first because it is an ignoble term, and second because Mr. Pickwick's figure was by no means adapted for that mode of retreat. He trotted away at as quick a rate as his legs would convey him so quickly indeed that he did not perceive the awkwardness of his situation to the full extent while too late. So like kind of like explaining like Pickwick, the way that he <laughs> walks and like his demeanor, I just think it's like so comical and sweet mm -hmm. and such a great way to really not talk, because I feel like it's so interesting how an author decides to describe their characters because like, yeah. of course they have an image of them in their head and every reader is going to have a different, slightly different image, depending on how much they describe them. Um, and he gives them so much personality in their physicality. And I just yeah. love that. Yeah. Um, and then there's another one from chapter seven, page 104. Um, I, I loved this. It's just, I think it's one of well, one of the side characters. Hmm. There's a little man with a puffy "say nothing to me or I'll contradict you" sort of countenance. Like, and there was like hyphens in between the "say nothing to me or I'll contradict you." Yeah, like, I just—it's so funny because you can picture that that expression. Everybody yeah. kind of knows what that looks like, and it's just brilliant. That's so good. Um, Another example that I have, I wanted to talk about his similes are absolutely stunning. Um, so this one is from chapter 11, page 143. No, replied Mr. Snodgrass, and a tear trembled on the sentimental eyelid like a raindrop on a window frame. Like, isn't that so sweet? It's so nice, what the heck? Right. Um, okay, and then we're gonna get into my complaint. Okay. Um, so my main complaint is the writing as a whole after a while felt a bit taxing. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if it was because it's such a long book or mm -hmm. if it's if it's the fault of his writing or if it's the fault of the reader, honestly, because I, you know, obviously it's different for every reader. Um, but I felt it felt a bit repetitive after a while. And it was sort of like, okay, we're having another misadventure or we're having another blunder or, you know, it just felt a bit like, okay, you know, like yeah. a bit redundant. Um, mm -hmm. And then, although I love his writing as a whole, the story slash stories kind of lost my interest the more that I read and 
my sense of engagement wasn't as strong as in the beginning. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know if that really relates to the writing because like for this section of the debate, his writing in general, I have pretty much nothing to complain mm -hmm. about um, because his writing yeah. is fantastic and really singular. And he's just such a gifted storyteller when it comes yeah. to putting words on a page. Um, mm -hmm. But like I said, the one thing that I do have my complaint is that after a while, it did feel a bit like, Repetitive. You know, like I kind of wanted to read something else. Yeah, no, I understand. I understand. I think with like the repetitive too, like I think it's incredible how like creative Dickens was able to kind of be seeing as like how much restriction was actually upon him writing like these monthly installments and having to get them out by a certain time and having to please like a certain amount of people and having to include certain aspects, which mm -hmm. um, like I do understand. And like, I think at least for us and I'm sure for you guys too, it did feel like, okay, <laughs> maybe um, I don't want to read like another scene of the exact same thing, but um, even in it, the way that he would kind of present it through his writing was really nice. And I think something else I really enjoyed too, like in later works, Dickens is so established and he is almost always like his own character or like we very much know he's the narrator yeah. um, and that narrator is a character and like he's talking to us um, like in a Christmas Carol and stuff like that. But in this one, I thought it was really interesting because it is like his first thing, but there's so much similarity between Pickwick and Dickens as well. Um, when in like, I think one of the first few chapters, um, Pickwick like gives kind of his mission statement as um, ruminating on the strange mutability of human affairs and to be an observer of human nature. I was yes. like, this is just what Dickens is doing in like yeah. this whole book and it's so nice. And like essentially Dickens kind of is Pickwick going around all over, traveling, walking at night, talking to people, being a mm -hmm. reporter for a little bit um, and writing down these stories that he did actually hear. So like that was so interesting to see a, like a little bit, like I know Pickwick isn't exactly Dickens, but there was so much there that I was just like, that is so, um, I can nice. definitely see that connection. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was really nice. Um, and like you said, it's just so funny. Like mm -hmm. I've never, I rarely ever laugh out loud um, yeah. at a book ever, but that, like the hat scene. The hat scene, I oh, it's like probably the best. The, the hat best scene, oh, um, I like sat there like crying. I'm like, yeah. that never happens. I don't know why I found it so funny because. Yeah. And I the just, illustration to accompany it, I, I was dying. Wanted. Oh my God, she's so great. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, yeah, and then I think probably another thing for the writing, it's just the imagery and also like, it's it's a book you can see, but I think especially with Dickens in this one, it's like such an audible book. Mm -hmm. um, so many people, like he makes sure to give everyone such a distinct like voice and dialogue mm -hmm. with different accents, different speech patterns. He shows us that like in the actual writing itself, which is so nice. Yeah. Um, and it's just like, you can hear everyone talking, especially like Mr. Jingle's way of talking, which is so, didn't love it, but like, you know yeah. exactly who's speaking and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Sam Weller, Sam Weller's father, um, each member of the Pickwicks, that was just really nice. And then his very kind of interactive imagery. Like there's this one scene, I think it's chapter, uh, five on page 52 of my edition. It's where he's like, he looks out the window. He's like staying in one of the hotels very early on. And then he just sees like a castle. Do you remember that one? I don't know. He sees like a castle in the distance and then he starts talking about it. But like the reader kind of assumes Mr. Pickwick's position looking out the window. And then Dickens is like taking us left and right. And it's very much a tour of everything. And I just, I don't know. It was just like that throughout the whole yeah. novel, like very yeah. much inclusive to the reader and to like where we were mm -hmm. um, kind of parallel to where the characters were like in a room or in a different city or a state or something like that which mm -hmm. um yeah it was just so nice yeah yeah i don't know i agree um yeah. so i'm gonna i'm gonna make a little um tolstoy comparison yeah. <laughs> so i feel like and i've heard, i've seen a lot of people talking about how how different they are and everybody, you know, is especially the people that are on both teams too. I'm sure you agree that they're such different yeah. characters. It's like, how can you compare them? Um, which it's very hard to compare them. And I think that that's what makes it really interesting to actually try and compare them. Yeah. Um, but I think it comes down to personal preference, honestly, um, especially with writing style because they're both such gifted writers that they go about the process of writing so differently mm -hmm. and 
they both have very different effects on the reader as well and they both have very different intents talking about intent earlier um mm. so for me personally obviously i'm you know on tolstoy's side i'm so sorry dickens um, <laughs> i love dickens but there's something about tolstoy especially i know i don't want to talk too much about war and peace but you know we did start reading war and peace in the beginning of april and while reading pickwick even though the writing is fantastic it it did easily lose lose my attention lose my interest and already with war and peace i'm only 50 pages in it is like so much longer than pickwick i don't want it to end i like never want it to end and there's some we were talking earlier about how great dickens is is writing characters and he is it's just fantastic how he does it um but tolstoy goes about describing characters in a way where he gives you attributes about them that you didn't know you wanted but yeah. you know like he gives you yeah. like the shadow on their upper lip or like the texture of their clothes and it's things that don't really relate to their distinct physicality but they add so much to the character itself and i feel like to some point dickens can be pretty surface level like he does go yeah. very deep in some situations but not so much in others and i feel like tolstoy really like he is so like deep is the only word that really is coming <laughs> to mind right now um and i his writing just i remember the quote i forgot who said it um but i think it's i first heard it in the original debate where someone said that if the world could write could write itself it would write like tolstoy and I just, I always love that quote. And I feel like people could say that about Dickens definitely because he definitely captured life really well. But I sort of feel like while reading the Pickwick papers, it was distinctly an English novel. Yes. And you can tell that it was very much, you know, in the confines of um, English life. Whereas yeah. with, with Tolstoy, I feel mm -hmm. like I'm not Russian. I've never been to Russia. I know very little about Russian culture, yet I relate so much and I feel like I'm so a part of Tolstoy's writing um, in a way that I'm just not there with Dickens. So no. that's my little yeah. spiel. No, that was a super good point. Like, super, um, yeah, I totally agree. Like, I think Pickwick is very confined. Like, there's so many jokes, I think, that just absolutely went right over my head, both yeah. because I'm not from um, the same century or the same like location. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, I think, yeah, like I'm only about 25 pages into War and Peace, but um, yeah, I would totally agree. Totally agree with that. And like, um, I think a lot of the time too, like Tolstoy talks about everything that's relatable um, and real, but then in Pickwick, like it's a bit of a point I think for both, but Dickens and Pickwick, like it just shows he can, like he can literally just do anything um, mm. and write about anything. Like a chair turns into a man, a man yeah. turns into oh a chair. Oh my gosh, that was one of my favorites. That would never, Tolstoy would never, no. Tolstoy would never make a like A chair is a chair and that is it. Or maybe yeah. a metaphor for like, yeah. the inju you know, the injustice of war and yeah. the philosophy of, um, you know, how we are all, I don't know. Um, destined or, for death or so. <laughs> um, but I just think like, yeah. he's just, I don't know. He just like assaults your assumptions about every single genre, about what can happen a uh, in a book, what should happen in a book. Um, and I think it's just like a surprise every time you turn the page. Like, did you, th I didn't know a man was going to turn into no, a chair. I was not um, expecting that. No, exactly. And I think yeah. with Tolstoy, like you very much, like you know what you're getting and that's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, like you said, they're just so... Different. He surprises you in different ways. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, mm. but I was just so blown away, like how he can just so seamlessly jump from like a ghost story that starts off dangerous and spooky and scary, and then by the end of it, um, it's just like you're laughing because mm -hmm. the ghosts are like, I don't know, cracking jokes about being ghosts or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's just like so impressive, and how quickly he does it, and how like spread out they are. He never lets you stay in the realm of like the serious. He never lets you stay in the realm of comedy for too long. It's always like a very good balance. Mm -hmm. um, even though it is kind of a repetitive balance yeah. if that makes sense. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was just super impressed. But yeah, 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 these are really good points too. The Madman story, like the manuscript. Oh, that is so great. So good, yeah. so good. 
it really um, felt like a short story collection to me. Like it, yeah. And that's I'm going to talk a bit more about that when we get talk about structure. Um, but yeah, I don't want to say too much before that. But yeah. Should we uh, should we get into characters? Yes, 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 yes. Would you like to begin? Sure. Um, so in my journal, I wrote characters mm -hmm. slash caricatures. <laughs> because, I mean, like, it's a strength and a weakness, I think, yeah. because you can do so much with, you know, archetypes and caricatures. But there is also, you know, pros and cons to that type of character. Yeah. Um, so Although his characters were fun and entertaining, um, they didn't really feel real to me. And, you know, like, I knew that they were fictional characters. I, I felt their falsity in a way. Whereas yeah. when reading Tolstoy, sometimes I forget I'm reading a fiction, a fictional novel. It almost feels like a non-fictional account, or it feels like I'm actually in the book with them. And, you know, I'm really watching what's happening. So I do feel like the characters, going back to the feeling of depth, I do feel like the characters are not very deep. And I don't think that Dickens really intended them no, to be deep. Not. Whereas, you know, Tolstoy wanted that gravity in his characters, in his work, and that realism. Yeah. Whereas Dickens, you know, wanted the, um, the fantastical, in a way. Um, so... I wrote down um, that I, you know, you can picture, you can picture Tolstoy's characters having lived, and yeah. you, know, yeah. you can you can see them having existed. Whereas I can't really picture <laughs> Samuel Pickwick, you know, what? walking around London. I just I just can't. I just chasing can't his it. hat. He's just chasing his hat every day. He is just chasing his hat. Um, it sort of felt like, I think the best way that I can describe it, mm. um, I guess in some sort of metaphor or analogy is, I feel like reading the Pickwick Papers and reading Charles Dickens sort of feels like you're watching an animated movie. And yeah. reading Tolstoy feels like watching a live action um, where, you know, there's just a just greater said. sense of realism. Kind of like... <laughs> But it makes sense to say Dickens characters a bit more in a stage while Tolstoy's is in a movie. I definitely, yeah, I definitely think so. I even think, so I, when did I make that? Okay, okay, we're going to get into this. All right, so, which is crazy because I made this analogy in my journal and then um, before I started reading War and Peace and then the, the person introducing War and Peace made the same analogy talking about Tolstoy and I was like, no way, so we're gonna talk about it. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> so I'll just read what I wrote down. Um, so I'll use the analogy of a puppet show to further the difference between how each author creates and writes their characters. So Dickens proudly holds the role of puppeteer in a puppet show. Um, he wants you to see what he has created. He wants you to laugh and be entertained. Um, by the falsities of his show. He wants you to see all the strings that are attached to these fantastic puppets. Um, whereas Tolstoy, he doesn't want you to see himself as the puppeteer, or he does, but in a more subtle way. And um, he doesn't present himself in the way in the same way that Dickens does to the reader. You're yeah. conscious of his narration, but he doesn't say, you know, I am the narrator, yeah. acknowledge my presence, yeah. kind of yeah. like he does, especially in A Christmas Carol. Exactly, yeah. Um, and then also he wants you to think and feel deeply and there there aren't falsities to Tolstoy, where are, whereas there are in Dickens, to Dickens' strength and weakness, I believe. Um, so, Tolstoy doesn't want you to see the strings, unlike Dickens. Dickens yeah. wants you to see all the things that he's created and put together and, oh, look at this fantastic, you know, literary technique that I've created or I've played with and yeah. uh, put them all together to make this wonderful show. Um, so Tolstoy doesn't want you to see the strings. In all actuality, there are no strings to the show. And his puppets are people who have their own will and 
ultimately there are no strings, which I just think uh, kind of furthers my furthers my analogy. So then I'm going to get my copy of because oh it's right here. Um, conveniently, yes. Conveniently, it's right here. Everyone look, it's so beautiful. Um, Okay, I even wrote in the margin, I was like, I just made this analogy the other day. Okay, um, yeah, so I wrote in, in the margin, I can't believe this. Um, today, okay, it was the day before I started reading the book, um, I made the puppet analogy in the Pickwick Notes. Okay, um, <laughs> let's see, where should I begin? Okay, um, theater and theatrical movements are highly significant in War and Peace. Uh, both in the war sequences and in the peace episodes. The sense that the characters of War and Peace, both great and small, act and move as if connected by threads of destiny um, and is just below the surface of this work of art as it relentlessly questions ideas of free will, fate, and providence. Each of Tolstoy's major characters at some point observes life as if it were a theater. Each one at, at significant points in his or her journey senses that he or her is playing a role and that things could not be otherwise. That mm -hmm. what happens is somehow scripted or inevitable. Um, and then it goes into somewhat of a spoiler, so I'll skip that. Uh, do, do, do. So it says he performs his assigned role um, and then it also says, I, I'm just missing spoilers, hold on. Um, okay, so the imaginative reader might perceive the broken threads of the puppet strings. So like, I was just, I literally made that analogy hmm. and then I read this that night and I was like, I was in there, yeah. What? <laughs> so I think that it's fantastic hmm. because the, the person introducing the book, um, I forgot what his name is. Let me just credit him. Uh, oh, it's a woman, Amy Mandelker. Um, that like, because she's kind of describing it as there are strings. Yeah. And so I think yeah. that it's, it was so interesting to really <laughs> make that connection. I think it really depends on you, the reader. Yeah, to think, you know, are there strings, are there not strings? Mm -hmm. um, yes, so. Yeah. Do you want to, I feel like I've been chatting. Sure, no, no, I totally interject. <laughs> um, I think like you said, like, yeah, it is a very much like your own um, opinion. And I think like, I don't know. I just love both. I think like you love both as well. Like the yeah. theatrical um, and like seeing the strings and not seeing the strings sort of thing. Like mm -hmm. with Dickens and the Pickwick papers, like I like that I kind of know that that's there. And I like like seeing that it's there because it's still so impressive to me. Um, and impressive in the way that, as well that he's like showing us that it's impressive if like that makes yeah. sense. Um, mm -hmm. But in the Pickwick papers as well, like the characters, like I know we're on character um, at the moment, but like they are very much not that deep. And like you said, that's not really his intent. Um, mm -hmm. But I think I really loved how each of the Pickwickians and Mr. Pickwick included, like they all held and they were all attributed with that one certain um, personality trait or hobby or whatever it may be that really define them. And I think like with the characters in this book and everything that they go through and with the issues that they face and with the commentary that's brought up, um, it's super theatrical. There's so much of a farce made of politics and law and romance and human connection, Victorian and pre-Victorian morals. But I think in that, like, I was kind of, I kind—I think I wrote down or something that um, it's like Dickens novels are kind of wearing stage makeup, mm. but I wouldn't say the stage makeup on his novels is there to kind of hide or obscure the truth or kind of make a mockery of anything, but it's there like for us, the reader and the audience in this case, because it is such theater um, mm -hmm. to be able to like see it better. And for us to be able to pick out those aspects that um, he's dressing up in certain ways and for us to be able to analyze them through that kind of costume and that dress up and that stage makeup, which was really interesting. But um, I think like it is just all down to your personal preference, but I think yeah. there's so many good things and bad things you can say about both um, styles. And I think with the Pickwick papers, like because Dickens was so um, boxed in writing it and he had to fill like quotas and meet certain people's expectations and write about certain topics, he managed to kind of layer all of this, um, what do you call it? Not confetti, but like, Friviality. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know what I mean. yeah. Icing on the cake over top of these mm -hmm. super important 
um, issues that people of the day reading it, the upper class, the middle class, maybe they wouldn't have pushed away, but maybe they would have um, kind of had an easier time of digesting and like actually thinking about these important issues that did not affect them at mm -hmm. all. That They would probably be super used to just brushing by and not looking at very much, but I think the pick papers does confront with that, but it gives them a little bit of like a, um, you know what I mean? Like a shield from it completely with this entertainment yeah. level with this theater uh, level kind of on top of it, which is interesting, but um, yeah, they're just so good. I don't know, which one do you guys like more? Like, do you like the theater? Do you like like the theater, but not theater um, kind of style? I don't know. They're both so good. They're both so good. They are. And I feel yeah. like they, you know, like you said, they have the strengths and weaknesses. And I think it's interesting to sort of like pick and compare them and figure out, you know, because they're so different, like which one as a reader you prefer. It's, mm. I feel so lucky that we can, that we have both of these fantastic styles. And, you know, we have the choice of like, oh, you know, which am I in the mood for? Because I'm such a mood reader. Yeah. And I think, but my point is though, is like, I'm always in the mood for Tolstoy. And I feel like it's kind of like figuring out who you're always in the mood for. Um, yeah. Something else that I wanted to talk about is that I did feel like Mr. Pickwick was the only character that was really fleshed out. And like, yes, he's the main character and that, yeah. you know, that happens um, naturally. Uh, just with your main character being the writer, of course, you know, you're going to give the reader the most information about them. Um, but I kind of felt like after a while, his other friends, like Mr. Tutman, Mr. Snodgrass. Um, and Winkle, yeah. And Winkle. Like, I sort of, not that I forgot about them, but we didn't really, like, get them as much. <laughs> and I, I sort of felt like, oh, where did they go? Where did Mr. Tubman yeah. go? Where did Mr. Tubman, Tubman go? <laughs> he left. He left the book. I don't he, know. Did. Yeah. he did. He yeah. did. Um, yeah. And I just, I feel like in Tolstoy, even if mm. there's an insignificant character that has maybe one line, yeah. we get like, we get something to hold on to about them. Whereas mm -hmm. I feel like Dickens sort of gives us these somewhat central characters and then sort of is like, okay, never mind. You know, like they're not going to be on these pages. I know. Which I just like want to know why I think. Not really like criticizing that because maybe it's intentional. Yeah, I don't know. I think that that's interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think with like just with the four Pickwickians, like Snodgrass, Tupman, Winkle, and um, oh, Pickwick is the fourth one. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I just think like compared to Tolstoy, like, I just talking about kind of childhood boyhood youth at the moment, but we like we know when he was writing that trilogy, like he wasn't um, super. He didn't believe in like what he was writing. It seemed like he was writing something like false, and it was a lie, and he wasn't actually invested in these ideas. And like while his characters in childhood boyhood youth are super fleshed out, and like you said, we always have something to take away um, from them. I think the characters like in Dickens, they are flat, and they do. They're not super flat, but you know what I mean. They're yeah more flat. Um, they embody this one thing that like Dickens really like does believe in, and you can tell he's so um, passionate about like letting you know about this issue or about um, these follies. And like after I finished the book and closed it, I was just like the kind of three defining features of like Pick, uh, Tupman, Winkle, and Snodgrass, like poetry, <clears throat> women, and um, uh, hunting and athletics. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was um, not sure where you were going with it. <laughs> they're just kind of like um, useless. They always lead them into trouble. They never bring them into any situations of value or um, good things in their lives. And they're just kind of there to critique like that upper class um, hobbies and personality and like the way they're brought up. And like we always see that like those three things that those men have lead them into like bad. <laughs> like mm -hmm. um, just completely missing the point of certain debates and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I definitely agree though. Like, where did they go? They yeah. kind of just left. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm just reading some of the comments. Yeah. Um, let's see. I like the one where it says, um, it's yeah, a special lover. I like Dickens because of so much mm -hmm. of his work has mm -hmm. become part of the English language. Calling someone a Scrooge has become part of the English lexicon, which I, I totally agree. Even like humbug. And 
I feel like it's because A Christmas Carol is such a household story and the, you know, like you're saying the English lexicon, it's part of the English lexicon. I think that it's mm -hmm. really interesting how that has happened and it sort of transcended time. Um, I definitely do think, I mean, of course, War and Peace and Anna Karenina like have transcended time as well, but yeah. I don't think they've infiltrated the home. I think they've infiltrated the mind of the reader. Yeah, but I feel like Dickens does have a place in people's homes. If yeah, that makes any sense. Yeah, um, here he is. He's right there. He's right there. <laughs> you can see him. Yes, yes. Yeah. Here he is. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, but I do think that. Where where Dickens infiltrates the home, like I, I mean, that sounds like he's a uh, he's um, breaking and entering. <laughs> he's infiltrating the home, no, um, but he's he's there in in people's hearts. But I do feel like Tolstoy is there in people's minds. So they're both there, but in different places in in yeah. the reader. They affect the reader differently. Um, Something that I do kind of want to complain about Let's talk. Um, <laughs> is um, Dickens name calls quite a lot, which I wasn't really expecting. I mean, I feel like, uh, I don't know. Um, I'll get into what I was going to say. Yeah. Um, so he mainly describes people's physicality sort of in a judgmental tone. At least that's like how I felt when reading the book. Um, the the one character that I felt so bad for was Joe, also known as the fat boy. Yeah. Every five seconds, the fat boy, the fat boy, the fat boy. And I was like, it's not like he didn't give us his name and we don't know his name. That's, it. that's our only way to distinguish who Dickens is talking about. But we have his name, his name is Joe. Use his name. His is name. Yeah. Use his name. Um, and um, I don't know if this bothered the 19th century reader, but it definitely bothers this 21st century yeah, reader. Yeah, exactly. um, and I don't know if it's because we have become more sensitive to things like that and to certain topics revolving around, you know, name calling people. Yeah. So yeah. Joe. I know, I felt bad for Joe too. Um, and I feel like his only, you know, distinguishing qualities was that he slept all the time and he ate copious amounts of food. Um, yeah. And even there are descriptors like this one, chapter four, page 65, um, the fat boy waddled. I was just like, you could have said Joe waddled, but I, um, but it's saying the fat boy, like in conjunction with this descriptor of like waddled, I was like, come on Dickens. Um, but what I found really interesting was that, and I don't know if the 19th century reader would have known this, but mm. um, I, I discovered this while researching. Um, so we do know about Joe that he consumes great quantities of food and constantly sleeps in any situation at any time of day. And there's a reason for this, which I didn't realize until I found it out while mm. researching. Um, Joe's character actually became the origin of the medical term Pickwickian syndrome, which ultimately led to the subsequent description of um, obesity um, hyperventilation syndrome, uh, a condition relating to sleep apnea, which I was so baffled by because yeah, I did not. Know that. Yeah, if you didn't know that, then you're like, why is this guy sleeping all the time? You know, why is it always mentioned that he like can't help himself but like just consume all the food? Um, so I guess this is his way of bringing humor to a more troubling syndrome or condition or topic just in general. But I don't. I just felt like maybe he could have mentioned that this had some medical backing. It was sort of like thrown in there just for jokes and I didn't find it very funny. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's my little uh, spiel about, about yeah. Joe. Um, Joe. Should I continue on? I have more. Go for it. I think you have another <laughs> point you want to make, so I'm just going to let you go. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I'm just gonna say it, it's the elephant in the room. I've seen so many people commenting it. 
Women. 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 Where were they? Where were they? <laughs> I fainted. Um, what? Nothing. Just uh, uncon <laughs> unconscious, really. Okay. Um, to quote Charles Dickens, chapter 14, page 184. Women, after all, gentlemen, said the enthusiastic Mr. Snodgrass, are the great props and comforts of our existence. Mic drop. <laughs> he literally I calls know. women props. I read I that know. and I was like, I know. What? I know. What? what? <laughs> oh women. my God. Never heard of them. No. No. Yeah. I was good point as well the characters we did get um i can't even, i can't tell them apart yes, still yes, I think no, okay them. wait I'm, I'm not done i'm not done go go keep going um okay to quote charles dickens again <laughs> chapter 12 page 161 mrs bardell had fainted in mr pickwick's arms um and then continuing on chapter 18 page 238 but the unfortunate man's voice was drowned in the screaming of his partner. Um, Mrs. Pott, let me entreat you, my dear ma'am, to compose yourself, said Mr. Winkle. But the shrieks and tappings were louder and more frequent than ever. If they aren't fainting, they're screaming or swooning or causing some kind of havoc for the men. I don't have anything to say. You're right. You're right. It's just like... I want to know why. I want to talk to Dickens, sit him down, be like, explain yourself, please. Uh -huh. So, because I feel like we did see the misunderstanding of women in childhood boyhood youth from Tolstoy's side. Yeah. But it's so obvious in Pickwick Papers, like, sadly so. I know, I know. I don't really have anything. Like, maybe, I don't know. Talking about childhood boyhood youth, like yeah, mm -hmm. Dickens or uh, Tolstoy not fully understanding women, whereas Dickens, um, yeah. like it was just so it was literally every single scene. Like I kid you not, like maybe minus five scenes mm -hmm. um, where we had women in the scene, like in the first yeah. place, but um, they just fainted. Um, yeah. And like especially not only that, like women and individuals and the characters we did have, but then coupled with the Pickwickians and like those relationships that were formed there, like. Um, it just kind of being used to show like the trouble and I guess I don't know the the morals of the pre-Victorian world but mm -hmm. um but my question is did women actually act this way I really don't think so I really, I really don't think I, so. I mean I feel like, like, they, like they had to I don't know yeah I don't know I mean yeah I guess maybe society made that the norm um yeah, yeah. uh I have I have one more Okay. Um, which furthers my point. Um, okay, so once again, to quote Charles Dickens, chapter 18, page 242. Is it not a wonderful circumstance, said Mr. Pickwick, that we seem destined to enter no man's house without involving him in some degree of trouble? Beneath whatever roof they locate, they disturb the peace of mind and happiness of some confiding female. So basically, women just play roles to just to interact with, give the men something to interact with. That's how it felt for me. Like they were just there because women exist and they have to, you know, he had to write women in because women are a part of humanity. It didn't really feel like they had a purpose or an intention. And he just basically used them as little props to stick in his scenes to make them interesting. and. I just, it was so frustrating. I know, I know. I had to stop reading at certain points because I was like, I can't do this. <laughs> I can't. And what makes me really sad too mm. is like, did Dickens know or even think about like women reading it or future women reading it? You know, because I feel like at that time, women weren't obviously educated the same women weren't given the same rights, even for Tolstoy too. Like my question for these classic male authors is, did you realize that women would eventually read your work? I don't know. They, I think they had to, right? I mean. That's what I think. I mean, I'm trying to like look on, look for the good in them. 
Yeah, I know, I know. I, I do know. feel like, and we talked about this with the Childhood Boyhood Youth um, live show, is that it is a part of reading classic novels written by white men. Um, let's see, yeah. I love how the women in the Brontes and the Austens books are the complete opposite. Yes, yes, and that like furthers my point is, it's not like only men wrote in this time period. We got women novels and we got yeah, women of stories. For instance, Jane Eyre. Jane Jane herself is such a strong, deep, considerate and thoughtful character. She she never swooned and she never screamed and I mean maybe she did, but like not to the extent of being overdone like Dickens does to these poor women in these novels. Uh -huh. um, and something else was that, like, he really accentuated the physicality of women in Pickwick Papers. Like, when there was a beautiful woman, he made sure that you knew she was beautiful. That was, like, her distinguishing quality. I remember one of the characters, he kept describing her bright eyes. She has bright eyes, and then her bright eyes, and her bright oh. eyes. And, like, every five seconds. I was just like, yeah. okay, we get it. She has bright eyes. She's very pretty. She's a flashlight. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> She's lighting the way. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, yeah, I don't really have anything. I'm not I'm not gonna say anything, but I think um, <laughs> with any issue that's brought up, like Dickens is like he's totally just relying on people at the time just laughing and like having a yeah. good time with that, even though of course like it's horrible. Um yeah. but yeah, I don't really <laughs> I agree. Something that I, will, something that I will say, and I will yeah. give Dickens some credit, is yeah. that in Great Expectations, he writes yeah, two grow. very strong yeah. female characters, you know, Miss Havisham and Estella. And I'm so glad we started with Great Expectations because I'm at, like, that's why I'm saying, do not start with Pickwick yeah, Papers. Yeah, because, don't do it, don't do it. yeah you're, you're gonna think that Tolstoy is, I mean, not Tolstoy, Dickens is uh, very close-minded and sexist. Um, so, but like in Miss Havisham and Estella, we do get these very complex female characters. So I do think that, you know, part of it is he's a very new writer. He might not have experienced, you know, he just got married. So he probably hasn't experienced life with a woman. And, you know, he he's a naive man ultimately. So. Mm -hmm. Of course. And he's like super restricted having to write for. Yeah whatever they want him to write and mm -hmm. what will And it's a very male dominated read. industry. Book. Publishing book. at that well, yeah. time. Yeah, publishing at that time, I'm sure everybody that he worked with was male. So, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, someone said, is Tolstoy not sexist then? It's really, it's hard to throw that word around, I think, because, you know, we're we're dealing with men from a different time period in a different society ultimately kind of in a different world so mm -hmm. i feel like to a point like how do you define sexism is there really a definition and as well as you know both could be seen as sexist in different people's viewpoints uh, i think it really depends on what you consider the term and how you define the word yeah uh i for me, I like to, um, yeah, someone just said they weren't sexist in their time. I completely agree because that was the norm. You know how everybody in today's day is trying to normalize things, um, normalize body image, normalize mental health, and they're very important topics. But at that time, that was normal. So I do feel like in defining them as sexist in our day, yes, you could say that they're sexist. But in their time, they weren't seen as being that way. So I do feel like as a modern reader, we have to look at it from both viewpoints and acknowledge that. Yeah, it's definitely a difficult. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. So we just had to get that out of the way. That <laughs> it needed to be discussed. We Absolutely. discussed it. Absolutely. Um, let's, I just want to see um, yeah. if we should say anything that people are. Um, okay, someone said that's why Dickens is so good. He didn't care about appealing to the masses and minorities, um, which is what mostly destroys today's media. I definitely agree. Um, it all, someone also said underneath, I mean, it's a white man writing a book in the 18th century. You really shouldn't expect much. And like, 
I agree, but I do feel like it's it goes both ways. You know, I feel like there's no right or wrong answer to anything, and we're coming at this as modern readers. Of course. Um, so it's like it's the cha it's the challenge of reading classics, especially written by two white men, um, who pretty much did have privileged lives. Something that I did want to mention as well is that Tolstoy was born into uh into money ultimately dickens wasn't dickens his family was put in a debtor's prison so they're very different writers based on their experiences even uh their monetary experiences that what they've gone through and how that relates to the stories that they write and the characters that they write you know because even though my point is, sorry, I <laughs> things going on in my head trying to trying to word this correctly. I think you have to consider what the author has been through and their viewpoint, um, which is why we have the category in the debates of intent and background yeah, because yeah. they ultimately completely relate to the stories. Um, same thing with women. Same thing with sexism, and um, you know, people talk about how Tolstoy had serfs, and then other people talk about how. Um, you know, Dickens only wrote for money and to, uh, you know, because why his books are so long is because he had, you know, he was paid by the word. So there are these different aspects to the writers it, that aren't cut and dry. Um, yeah. So. yeah. 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 Uh, anyway, um, should we talk about plot and structure now? Yes, let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Do you want to go? I feel like I've been. Sure. No, no. Okay. You Good, that's amazing. Um, and I think we were just with everything we talked about, like I'll talk a little, like I have a few points to make about it too when we get too intense, sure. just to finish up the debate, but yeah, to talk about plot. Um, okay, I guess we'll just complete topic change now. Yeah. Um, but I guess I'll go back to a little bit of like that reality. I found it really interesting how when Pickwick started, like um, Dickens kind of took on this guise of like, this is like reality. These were things that actually happened and I'm only, the, like the editor of these papers, I'm only the one putting them in order, editing their journals and stuff like that. And it was just really interesting to kind of have that against, um, not necessarily like accusations of being theatrical, but just like that theater that Dickens does have. Um, but the fact that he started like the Pickwick papers already basing it on a foundation of like reality and convincing mm -hmm. you that yes, this is real. This was the Pickwick club. These are the posthumous papers of their club was really interesting. So it kind of takes on this kind of like mythological historical record kind of mm -hmm. book, which is really interesting. And I love that because it is like, it's not, it's not a book, it's like a history book. Mm -hmm. um, it's just so good. Like it captures every single faucet, facet, facet, not yes. <laughs> faucet. We're, um, we're washing our hands. I love sinks. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, you know what I mean? Every single I did, part. I did. That's it. <laughs> In reality. Um, like we have the clothes and the politics, the way people talk and every single food that everyone eats um, mm -hmm. and the law and the legal system and stuff like that. And it's just like such a good source if you are um, a historian or wanting to write something from this time period and from this location. Like it talks about so much geography, talks about local folklore and stuff like that. I just thought it was incredible how that was like put into this book and the reason why so much of it worked and was so enormously uh, popular and like grew so much like you said at the beginning was because people of the day like wanted to read about themselves wanted the book to be a bit of like a theatrical um i think mirror for themselves um and that's why it was so funny that's why it worked and so i think like there is like again like the debate between theater and realism but i think this book does have so much more reality in it than like might be presupposed so I just really love that. Like it was just like, like the historian, the dream of history. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, mm -hmm. that was so good. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, I do feel like it is somewhat of a limited history. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so like, I completely agree with you, um, and I do think that it's kind of like he's giving us a little insight into what life was like then. Yeah. No, exaggerated or not, false or not, it is, you know, we do get a glimpse. And I think that that's why I love classics so much is because 
it gives you that ability to time travel. And, you know, yeah. Dickens gave that to the modern reader, whether he knew he was doing it or not. Same thing mm -hmm. with Tolstoy, same thing with Jane Austen, the Brontes, all these wonderful classic writers. Um, okay, this is kind of unrelated. Um, I did want to talk a bit more about the structure and the like publication yeah. of the book. So yeah. since this book was originally serialized, it came out obviously monthly. So readers were reading, you know, a chapter or however much a month, putting it down, waiting, getting it again, getting that excitement for it to see what would happen next. And I think it's almost to the detriment of the modern reader because we're, we're given it as a book, one full volume. Um, but the 19th century readers were getting it mm -hmm. as, you know, a serialization. Yeah. And so I do feel like this book, if you're reading it, you should read it as a serialization. You should pick, yeah. you know, a certain amount of pages or a certain amount yeah. of chapters and read them over a long span of time. Because I do feel like if you try to read it like a novel, it's, it's just a bit, it's a, it doesn't read it's like a novel. Like a, it's yeah. really not. And, yeah. um, and something else is that um, I think my my personal enjoyment would have been better if I read it that way. So I, I do mm -hmm. acknowledge that. Um, yeah. And I feel like, yeah, I just, it wasn't, he wasn't writing it to be read all at one time. No, no. Um, and like I said, yeah, they could be bound together and reread as one volume. But I think the strength of the structure itself and the publication does lie in reading it like a serialization. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think that's like my main issue with the plot and the structure. Well, for one, there really was no plot. Like, no. if you, I think if you end, try, like at the end, it tied in together more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you if you like made a map, you know, yeah. you know how like the typical like structure map of the, um, I forgot what they're called. I learned about them, we learned about them in, in school. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Expedition. like beginning, climax, end. You know, yeah. like there's, there's none of that. There is none of that. Um, which I think is why the book gets tedious after a while, is because we, we aren't holding on to one tangible plot where, okay, we want to know what's going to happen. It's sort of like we're, we're getting yeah. these little bits and we're yeah. trying to, you know, collect them. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, yeah. The only thing I can kind of say in defense of that, I think, is that at least kind of from episode to episode, it was, like, balanced. Like, we had kind of the heights mm -hmm. um, and kind of the bowels of human existence. We had so much comedy. We had so much seriousness as the kind of thing to keep it um, steadily rolling, I guess. Yeah. But, like, it did grow definitely tedious and, like, having to come back again to things that seemed very disconnected and, on that regard, a little bit pointless because of that disconnect, I think. Mm -hmm. um, like, I really, really enjoyed the first half of the Pickwick Papers. Um, and as I kept going, it just kind of lost a little bit of the magic for me. Um, yeah, but then at the end, like, it did tie together, especially once we got, like, the trial mm -hmm. with Bartle uh, and Pickwick. Yeah. That kind of all brought everyone together and stuff like that, which was nice. Mm -hmm. And then... I, I guess I like the way it wrapped up, but yeah, um, I did. I really liked the ending. Yeah, yeah. I felt like it was really sweet because they do kind of give you that closure that I was hoping for. So yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, did you want to go to intent, or yeah, did you have? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, my my main thing about structure yeah. is that. I don't think it should be read as a novel. No, much. completely agree. I yeah. think you should like pick it up and like read a segment once a month or something. Yeah, like treat it like a short story um, collection almost. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it would be so cool to like read it like as the same way that they would have read it um, mm -hmm. in the day. So yeah, yeah. Um, but in terms of intent, I guess kind of bouncing off of that, I have a few points. The first thing is kind of about those social issues that I think Dickens is so passionate about and manages to squeeze so many of them into the Pickwick Papers. And he does, like we did already mention that he layers them and like wraps them up with this fantastical ribbon and like wrapping paper to be more um, digestible and like kind of suitable for the people of the day, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. But he does kind of frame them in that distorted lens, I think, to... Yeah 
like show us how absurd and how ridiculous these things are, like especially the trial. Um, maybe you could argue all the women fainting, um, mm -hmm. the, the fungus, the rotting fungus pit of Dodson <laughs> and Fogg's office and like the legal system um, and stuff like that. And also like the ineffectual kind of aspects of the four Pickwickians and mm -hmm. like they're just so bad at doing yeah. normal things. They, they get lost, mm -hmm. they can't ride horses, they don't know how to travel. Mm -hmm. um, and I think like we didn't really they talk about- They don't know how to that. retrieve their hats. They, they don't know how to hold on to their hats. <laughs> um, yeah, that too. And I think like we didn't really talk too much about Sam Weller, but I think, I feel like- I he's love favorite. Sam Weller. I um I was reading I actually yeah so someone I was reading Don Quixote and someone I think DM'd me on Instagram and they were making the connection of Sancho Panza which is like Don Quixote's squire um, yeah. like, kind of like sidekick yeah. I've heard that Sancho Panza and Don Quixote are like the original hero sidekick duo yeah um, they kind of created that trope which I just love. But I could definitely see that with Pickwick and Sam Weller. And then I was even, um, I was looking at Pickwick papers on Goodreads and yeah. I just happened to like stumble upon the description that Goodreads gives it, like the synopsis. And Goodreads itself makes that connection. They were saying like um, Sam Weller, the Sancho Panza to Pickwick's Don Quixote. And I was like, oh my yeah. God, like that's amazing. It's like Frodo um, and Sam, I don't know. Yes. Yeah. I know, I was thinking that too, and I'm like, Sam, Sam? I know, I know. I just love that he gave us, like, so much insight into Sam. Like, Sam got so many chapters. I know. Uh, and we got to, like, grow so close to him and know who he was. And we saw, like, how much better of not only, like, a person, but also how much more able Sam Weller mm -hmm. is than, like, these four guys who are just literally buffoons and have no idea what they're yeah. doing yeah. Um, out on the road and how Sam has to help them so much. But just, I was so surprised that we got... <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I was just so surprised <laughs> that we got so much of Sam because it was such, it was so wonderful. I loved Sam yeah. so much. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah. What do you want to say about I have for intent, um, I do have like entertainment and to bring humor to the serious topics, talk about things that were relevant to the day. Yeah. Um, something else that I just want to reiterate that I mentioned a bit before was that, um, they both wrote for different reasons, Tolstoy and Dickens. Um, Tolstoy was born into money, so he didn't really have to write to sustain a living, no. but Dickens did, you know, that was his job. So I do feel like that is worth acknowledging um, yeah. because like, if we're talking about intent and why it was written, you yeah. know, why was Dickens writing? Yes, because it was a part of his life and he loved to write, but also that was his livelihood. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's a bit different for Tolstoy. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's um, there was like this one quote from the introduction that was just like so nice about the Pickwick Papers and how it like it's a book like anyone can pick up and anyone can love. But it just said mm -hmm. um, judges on the bench and boys in the street, gravity and folly, the young and the old, those who are entering life and those who are quitting it alike would have enjoyed the book. And Aww. we're reading it like because like they, I don't know, it was just all over and like gaining so much popularity, which was yeah. so nice. Um, like it is a very kind of closed, I think, appreciation of this um, time period and of this location and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. like I can see even as someone who doesn't understand everything, all the references and stuff like that, that it would yeah. um, have worked and would have kind of brought about this like closeness and um, I guess connection with everyone who's reading it at the same time. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. And also like one of the last things I want to say about intent is that kind of like you know all the little like short stories that aren't um like the direct plot and stuff like that mm -hmm. so many of them are kind of about the abuse of arts and like the portrayal of arts and like artists and stuff like that which is a really interesting um i think topic for dickens to be writing about especially like what he's doing with the pickwick papers like one that just really i think embodies them all is chapter three which is the one called the stroller's tale um, mm -hmm. that's the one where the actor, like it's the older actor, I think, and he gets extremely ill and he's also extremely poor, but he has mm -hmm. to keep working. But yes, then because yeah. he's ill, like the stage people and the managers and everyone like that, they use his illness and like, he's literally dying, but they mm -hmm. use it for entertainment value and for like this realist depiction of these like real actors and stuff like yeah. that. And it's just, it was just so tragic. And I think so much of the book is like trying to pick out those 
moments of like abuse and exploitation of like art and mm -hmm. using people for art and stuff like that. And then Dickens, I think in the Pickwick Papers is a little bit, like he tries to undo a little bit of that by like writing down those stories yeah. um, and spreading like the truth of them and not just like using like, for example, the person from the stroller's tale as like that actor mm -hmm. um, that everyone is so entertained by because he's like dying. Um, and then just like telling us the truth of those moments. So um, yeah, I just thought that was really good as well. Yeah. <laughs> Someone just said, yeah. I need y'all's opinion on the poem Ode to an Expiring Frog, please. I was dying. <laughs> oh my God, that was hilarious. I've never read anything more exquisite, honestly. <laughs> like, oh, like the oh poetry award goes to that one. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. So funny. I love how it's like, because no one says expiring anymore. Like when we say <laughs> expiring, we're talking about food, like food going bad. Whereas like, oh, you know, um, my cat expired. <laughs> like it went bad. <laughs> Oh, you know, it's just so funny. So I think like the old terminology and like the different uses of certain words makes things yeah. so much more funny in classics, especially, yeah. you know, ode to an expiring frog. <laughs> wow. So good. Oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah. Um all right. Do you have anything else you want to say for intent? I don't I know. I don't think so. I don't have anything else noted. Okay. Should I like, should I post the poll now on YouTube? Yes. And then while we're waiting for some votes, oh, I do this. we can share our favorite quotes. Wow, that yeah. happened. Wonderful. Thank okay, you. one second. Let me like. I'm not Charles Dickens. <laughs> okay, so I the poll, if you guys want to go vote after this debate, um, who is your favorite author, Dickens or Tolstoy after you've listened to this whole thing. It's a bit long, I'm sorry. Um, I'll post it now on my channel, just in like the little community tab. And then um, I'm not gonna post, I don't think, an undecided, or should I? Yeah, no. No, you have to vote. Yes. I'm um, sorry team both, but you have to vote. You have to vote. Um, and then, yeah, okay, well, I put that up. If you wanna tell us your favorite quotes. Yes, I also want to acknowledge the very sweet comments saying, is it just me or does Emma look exceptionally pretty today? Face is already red. We don't have to do this. Okay. Okay, wait, how do I do this? That's a great question. Oh no, I got it. Keyboard. You got it? Okay. Yeah, you, you got um, it right. Okay. My first favorite quote is actually speaking of poems. It is the Ivy Green poem. <gasps> no, that was one of mine. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. It is chapter six, page 85. The whole poem is gorgeous. Um, but I picked my favorite little part of it is the brave old plant in its lonely days shall, shall threaten upon the past. For the stateliest building man can rise is the ivy's food at last. Creeping on where time has been, a rare old plant is the ivy green. Like, it's just, it's, it's so just good. Really beautiful. It's so good. It's so beautiful. Um, and then my second favorite quote is um, all of page 71, chapter 5. <laughs> I will turn to it while you do that. Okay, and it's up as well. I just okay. put it up. So Page you guys can go. Um, do you want me to do you want me to say my first one? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um okay, I guess I'll I like wrote down some spares just in case we uh overlapped. <laughs> okay, so my first one is on page three hundred and uh, 52 is a Christmas Carol one. It's like that little poem. It's yeah. like the poem in the book. Yeah. Um, it's the one that's like, let the summer sun to his bright home run. He shall never be sought by me when he's dimmed by a cloud. I can laugh aloud and care not how sulky he be. For his darling child is the madness wild that sports in fierce fevers train. And when love is too strong, it don't last long as many have found to their pain. 
and then like it goes through like every season and then it's like I hate every season except for Christmas and it was just (laughs) love it oh my gosh um okay should I share my second yes yes okay so it is chapter five page 71 and it's basically this whole page and what's funny is it's about rising early and experience the, experiencing the morning sun and i'm a night owl though like i i prefer sleeping in and staying up late which is so funny because my entire life i have wanted to be a morning person and experience the morning sun but i am i've just been a perpetual night owl um, uh-huh. maybe one day i will maybe i will be a morning person who knows okay Um, Ah, people need to rise early to see the sun in all his splendor, for his brightness seldom lasts the day through. The morning of day and the morning of life are but too much alike. And then it continues on. um, Oh, okay. And then I I made a little funny comment. Um, (laughs) It says, God, what would I forfeit to have the days of my childhood restored or be able to forget them forever? I was like, Nikolenka, is that you? <laughs> I literally wrote in the in the margins, Nikolenka, is that you? Um, another one on that page is the calm, cool water seemed to me to murmur an invitation to repose and rest. A bound, a splash, a brief struggle. There is an eddy for an instance. It gradually subsides into a gentle ripple. Ripple, the wads. The, the waters, <laughs> the waters, <laughs> the waters have closed above your head, and the world has closed upon your miseries and mis- misfortunes forever. I just love that, oh, cause I I'm a swimmer. I love swimming, and the whole like visual of a bound, a splash, a brief struggle. There is an eddy for an instant. It gradually subsides into a gentle ripple, and then this part: the water. Um, the waters have closed above your head and the whole world closed upon your miseries and mis- misfortunes forever. Like, that's how I feel when I swim. Oh, so when I read that, I was like, right, like right in the heart and soul. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. The Keep whole going. page, page 71, was just beautiful. Glorious. Oh, the sky was dark and gloomy, the air was damp, and you know, the streets were wet and sloppy. Oh. So good. Gorgeous. Okay, my, um, my last one's like one of the last quotes in the book actually it's from 717 um and it's like when they're all kind of together everyone's together at the end um it says let us leave our old friend in one of those moments of unmixed happiness of which if we seek them there are ever some to cheer our transitory existence here just like a tornado out there i don't know (laughs) Um, there are dark shadows on the earth, but its lights are stronger in the contrast. Some men, like bats or owls, have better eyes for the darkness than for the light. We, who have no such optical powers, are better pleased to take our last parting look at the visionary companions of many, sol- many solitary hours when the brief sunshine of the world is blazing full upon them. Ugh. Gorgeous. What? Gorgeous. what? These are all so good. Yes. Mr. Pickwick was a philosopher, but philosophers are only men in armor after all. Oh, amazing. Oh my God. It is the faith of all authors and chroniclers to create imaginary friends and lose them in the course of art. I love that one too. That's gorgeous. They're so good. Oh. Thank you guys so much for coming yes. out. This was so fun. This was so much fun. Um, Emma, <laughs> I am going to ask you the question everybody, especially me, is wondering what would that be I will marry you. or dickens <laughs> okay um, <laughs> oh. okay okay i'm going to vote i don't know i think i know what to vote. <laughs> yes! <laughs> yes 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 oh. i knew it Oh my gosh. Oh, the poll, the poll is on, on my um, YouTube guys. It's like on the community section. It should be probably in the subscription box yeah. as well. If you pull it up. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I knew it. What made you change your mind? <laughs> the Pickwick papers. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Like I really did love it. And like, yeah. I think when I switched to Dickens the first time, like I am just kind of basing it on everything I've read from them so far. Yeah. Um, and like childhood boyhood youth didn't really impress me, but neither so much did Pickwick papers, but then like on a great expectations and now being a little bit into war and peace, 
I think Tolster again, but mm -hmm. um, I really love like changing because it's just like so fun to yeah, kind yeah. of be on both people's team. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Everybody's saying Tolstoy forever. Tolstoy, Tolstoy forever. The man is literally like all I think. Like, it's honestly sad how much I think about Tolstoy. Because Caroline, you need help. I do need help. <laughs> Which I feel like, you know what's funny is because before we actually did the debate and we were just talking about it, and remember the first time we asked each other, like, who? okay, whose team are you on? Yeah. Like we both didn't know what each other was going to say because we had just finished reading Great Expectations and we both adored Great Expectations. And so I was like completely torn. Obviously, yeah. I like Tolstoy because, you know, Anna Karenina's, you know, a bit higher on the scale than Great Expectations, but Great Expectations is up there. Um, so it's just <laughs> Carol's story. Love it. Love oh it. <laughs> Oh my god! Um, so you're still on Team Tolstoy, I'm I'm assuming here. Oh, yeah. No, okay. no, I'm I'm Dickens. <laughs> April Fools? No, it's not. It's not. <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Um, when? What? What are you gonna say? I'm just I'm just looking at the votes. Sorry. <laughs> oh, look at the votes! Look at the votes! I know when. How long? How much more should we give it, guys? Have you all voted? Has everyone voted? I haven't voted. Should, I'm going to go vote. Well, I'm going to vote. <laughs> oh, no, wait. I can't vote. That's, that's sad. Okay. <laughs> wait. Can you see who's winning? Sorry, that was a weird laugh. <laughs> I've never heard that one before. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my gosh. Oh. Oh, my God. Um, yes, I can see how many people voted. Okay. okay. So far, we have 105 votes in. <laughs> and yeah, oh yeah, you guys can all see it anyway. It's oh awesome. yeah, everyone can see it. Everyone Tolstoy is winning, baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, if you guys haven't voted, it's just on the, uh, I don't know what to call it. It's on I YouTube. I think it's in your subscription box. It'll yeah, just it's pop up like a little comment. Um. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Excuse my unintentional evil laugh. Didn't realize I could do it. Okay. Okay. With the Pickwick Papers, I have changed to Team Tolstoy, says Broken Paperback Spines. <laughs> okay. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Before the debate, like, we did a little vote on Instagram before... Um, and the results were about kind of a 38-62 split. Yeah. Um, I know. For for Tolstoy. Um, so it's I would love to know. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I cut you off. What were you going to say? No, no. It's just interesting seeing like though. Oh, yeah. Definitely. I would love to know why you guys are on what team you're on. So, like, if you're saying your team Tolstoy, maybe, like, briefly tell us why. Like, I would love to know. Because, like, I know why I love him, and I know why, you know, Emma loves him. But I want to know why you love him. Um, something else that I want to talk about is, um, I'm just, just going to do it. I just, I'm just loving it so much. I'm just, I'm 50 pages in, and I'm Aww. loving it so much. Because the whole story is cute. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Young oh Tolstoy God. is Leo Boytoy, as Emma and I call him. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> you guys are hilarious. <laughs> oh, this should have been Dostoevsky versus Tolstoy. A lot of people were saying that, and that would be such an interesting debate. Yeah. But we based it off of the original debate by uh, Intelligence Squared, which is um, they did Dickens versus Tolstoy. So. Mm -hmm. Tolstoy is my beloved. <laughs> I am Team Tolstoy because, oh, sorry, I'm reading the, a different one. Um, just comparing the debut novels, I love, um, I loved more Tolstoy's style of writing. Characters and the descriptions were always on point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Dickens because I just have so much nostalgia with him while dancing when I was younger. We did the Christmas Carol. Aww. So much Dickens. Oh, it's so great. 
Team Tolstoy. I like Team Tolstoy because I like how he tells stories and I feel like his language is not as dense. I agree. I do feel like yeah. Tolstoy is a bit more of an accessible writer um, because yeah. Anna Karenina and his characters have always stuck with me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh, they're just both so good. Yeah. Team Dostoevsky all the way. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, the votes have changed a little bit from the the pre-debate ones. Oh, okay. Like, very minimally. Um, oh. So far, we have 148 votes. Would you like to know the result? Yes. Okay. So for Team Dickens, Team Charles Dickens, the man, the myth, the legend, we have 35% okay. of people. <laughs> um, and for Team Tolstoy, that, that means we have 65%. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> there you go. Um, but yeah, that's like a little bit, a little bit more on Dickens' side, like 3% more. But um, mm -hmm. yeah. The fear know. in Carolyn's eyes. Lucy, there was definitely fear in my eyes. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, let's see. I saw someone asked. Mm. Same thing. Um, um, what would be the first book to read by each of these authors? Do you mean like where to start with Dickens and Tolstoy? For if so, I mean we started with Great Expectations and loved it, but that's like one of uh, Dickens's like last works. Um, so if you're new to Dickens, I honestly would suggest maybe starting either with A Christmas Carol or Great Expectations because. I started with the Christmas Carol and I loved it because it was short and yeah. familiar. Mm -hmm. um, but Great Expectations is just like a fantastic novel. With Tolstoy, I feel like you can kind of start anywhere, honestly. Yeah. 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 Oh my gosh. I think I feel like Tolstoy has won this. I think he's yeah. won this round again. <laughs> Woohoo! Um, yeah, I'm just so excited to to finally be on his his side next time with War and Peace for our next book. So. I, yeah. We're not going to talk about it. I okay. don't know how I'm going to be on Team Dickens for War and Peace because I'm know, adoring it. Yeah. It's really just going to be Carolyn and Team Nothing ultimately. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Sorry, just, I just, I Emma, if you've given me a number, I'll you <laughs> amazing amazing oh my god, oh my god. they're and not only sliding into your dm they're sliding into your live show <laughs> um yeah war and peace though war and peace oh my gosh um oh my yeah we're gonna be taking another two months to read yeah. that one and then the live show will be on carolyn's channel i believe mm -hmm. uh the first week of june mm -hmm. june so yeah yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. Henry right, James I versus Virginia Woolf. You guys are doing, see, these would be fantastic debates. Debates. You <gasps> so many. What are you? Uh, okay, Dickens is now at 37, and Tolstoy Ooh. is down to 63. Okay. So, anyway. We still have the upper hand. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Thank you guys so much for coming. This was so yes. much fun. Um, I love yes. these debates so much. I know. It's, I yeah. think. Um, Emma and I were talking over Skype recently, and you were saying the vibes are immaculate. They are. Like, all of, all of you guys are so, like, you know, just positive and supportive of this, and uh, we just appreciate all of all of you so much. So, thank you so much. Aw, thank you guys so much. This was so mm -hmm. fun. Yes, it's always a blast. Okay, I guess, I guess we'll sign off. Yeah. Um, thank you guys so much for coming out and reading crazy long books with us. I'm so sorry. <laughs> we have like two big chunky works um, in yeah. a row, but I'm really excited for War and Peace. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Aww. It'll be worth it. The diploma at the end of the four year program of Dickens versus Tolstoy. You guys are all getting free cap and gowns at graduation. <laughs> the class mm -hmm. of 2024 Dickens versus Tolstoy. It's going to be a fantastic class. Oh, okay. Okay, I guess we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. All right. Bye. Enjoy War and Peace, everyone, yeah. if you're reading it. Okay. Bye. Ciao. Bye. <laughs>